All right. Well, uh, good evening, everybody. Brian Russell here, the league director, and welcome to the Crankin at the Creek Town Hall. Uh, intent for tonight is to try and inform everyone dialed in uh, tonight what's coming up this weekend. Uh, thanks for dialing in, whether you're a coach, a parent, or I think I even saw a student athlete or two dial in. Uh, the intent here is just to get you some information about what's going on at Browns Creek. Uh, we'll spend about 30 minutes doing that, and then we'll reserve about 30 minutes of our hour uh, for questions and answers at the end. But by way of format, go ahead and pull up your chat window right now. And if you've got a question as we're going through that first 30 minutes, I've got a couple capable uh, helpers tonight uh, to answer the questions as we go. And so let me introduce uh, who's on the line from the league staff tonight. Uh, I've got uh, Sean Moore our director of coach and team development. He's one of my uh, chat question answers uh, tonight. Also have Shel Frost, our programs director, uh, also gonna help answer some questions as we go along. I've got Todd Lester, our race director, uh, taking care of everything to make sure we're ready for Sunday. Uh, and then I've got, uh, I think uh, Diane LeBlanc was gonna dial in. Diane, are you on the line uh, yet? Just give me a comm check real quick. If not- Hi, Brian, can... yeah, I'm yeah. here. Great. Okay. All right. There you are. And then uh, Diane's our volunteer coordinator. And then Michael Lashley, our camping coordinator, uh, is with us as well. Going to answer some questions you might have about uh, how we do camping. Uh, so again, uh, we'll spend 30 minutes here uh, talking about Browns Creek and what's coming up. And then uh, 30 minutes towards the end uh, to just make sure we've got all your questions and answers uh, taken care of. What I'm going to do right now, though, is I will tell you I think the key to success for so many of our weekends, I'm going to share my screen, uh, is the flyer. Uh, sent that out this morning as part of uh, the invitation for this town hall. Uh, sent that out in our single track times today. And going forward, the focus of the single track times, uh, we'll release that every two weeks and we'll do that the Wednesday before uh, our event weekends. And so it will have some of the highlights of what's coming up for that weekend. But at the very top, uh, is that flyer that pretty much tells you everything that's going on for the weekend. So that that is your source document uh, for how uh, we're going to accomplish a weekend. But if you don't get those emails and you want to find the latest copy of the flyer, go to our website. So that's what's on the screen right here. Go to program overview right at the top and then scroll down to events and race results. Click on that and you will come to our events page. And just scroll down and you will see that we've got all of our events for the entire season uh, listed out there. And in this details column at the very top of each event is going to be a link for the flyer. And for all the subsequent events uh, past Browns Creek, we at least have a draft flyer for all those events where you get some at least what we think is the initial information. This link right here for cranking at the creek. If you click on that, that's going to bring up the flyer I posted this morning. And we, the league staff, think this is probably about as close as we're going to get uh, to the schedule and the people that are coming, whether that's food trucks. Uh, I think that's about as close as we're going to get. If we have to change that uh, prior to the weekend, it will be linked at that site I just showed you. We will always put the latest flyer uh, at the top of that website right there. So uh, we will scroll through this uh, very slowly before we turn over to some of the other staff members. You can see here right at the front of the flyer. Uh, here's where to find us. <laughs> here's, here's where Elizabethtown is, even some directions down at the bottom. And uh, for those that have been with the league for a little while, Browns Creek is one of our uh, earlier venues. We've been there before. Elizabethtown treats us really, really well. Uh, it's a really great venue, so much space in that open field, and it's just such a good vibe. So it's a nice way to start uh, the season off. Uh, typically a little bit warmer uh, this time of year, doing the races early. Uh, so thank you for our very Western teams that have to travel a ways to Browns Creek, uh, but pretty good venue for us. Uh, we did for this year add a table of contents. So if you are uh, not keen on uh, scrolling through all 29 pages of our flyer, uh, come to the table of contents and uh, find what you're looking for. And we will, we will highlight some of these uh, as we go through tonight. But yeah, if you just want to find what you're looking for, um, yeah, you can use that table of contents. 
Uh, right now, just for everyone's awareness, uh, I'll host a weather call tomorrow uh, about 11 o'clock a.m. Uh, with the league staff. We've got some great support from uh, meteorologists around the state. Elizabeth Gardner, as a matter of fact, from WRL as part of our weather crew. Uh, we'll get on the line and talk about what the weather's looking like for the weekend. Right now, looking pretty good. Uh, I think we're expecting some high winds Friday and Saturday, so be prepared to tie down your stuff. Uh, but we will make the final weather call tomorrow uh, around noon. And then some basic information, I will say, um, you know, we'll turn over to Diane here in a few minutes to talk about volunteers, but thanks for those that have already signed up to help us with parking. Uh, 532 student athletes for cranking at the creek. Uh, that's a lot of cars coming. And so uh, be patient with us as you come into the venue and uh, please listen to your parking attendants. Uh, we got to pack a lot of cars in, in a pretty close space and we want to do that safely. Uh, so please be patient with us as you're coming in uh, to the venue. Uh, registration is closed just to make sure we know what our numbers are. And as, as I mentioned, 532 uh, student athletes, uh, which I think is uh, up pretty good from from last uh, season. But again, we're not doing race caps, so uh, might have brought some more folks uh, out for this first race. Um, Sean, I'll pause here if uh, you want to say anything about our new feature uh, coaching tips for Browns Creek. Uh, no, I think it's fairly self-explanatory, but if um, anyone has any feedback, that would be great. Or if they have any questions about this, hopefully teams have been using it to uh, practice. It is a new feature for our flyers this year. Again, we've got draft flyers out. We're trying to give you an indication of uh, what is unique about this trail system. We all thought just for this first one, uh, practicing some passes and starts, probably a pretty good idea with all these uh, big student athlete numbers uh, coming. Uh, okay, so um, I already mentioned volunteers, uh, a little bit about parking, but a lot of volunteer requirements to pull off our races safely and make a good, fun environment for everyone. I want to turn it over to Diane now, uh, just to talk a couple things about the volunteer program. Diane? Okay, hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us this evening. So um, at every race this year, we will have home teams. Um, those have already been assigned. Um, the home teams are responsible for making sure that they really get as many volunteers as possible. Um, this year, um, actually as of today, we have 220, I think, volunteer spots and 183 of those are already filled. So that's um, definitely, yeah, it's a plus, Brian, thanks for that double thumbs up. Um, so everyone's really gotten the message. Um, so whether this is somebody's first season um, with us or whether they're a seasoned veteran of the NICA races, there is always a place um, where you can plug in and help. We have all kinds of different positions, um, you know, just, just things that you can help with, um, things from as, uh, as simple as what Brian said when people first come in, the parking volunteers, um, to people that are... Um, um, writing down numbers when students come across um, the finish line, um, people that work in, in the um, area where the students come in after they cross the finish line, crossing guards. There's just there's just a whole host of um, volunteer opportunities. So if that's someplace where you want to jump in, please let me know. Um, we do still have some um, entry level volunteer positions for this weekend. So again, if you feel like you would like to volunteer, um, just hit me up, um, Diane at North Carolina MTB.org. And then the last thing I want to say, um, Brian, is that um, one of the changes that we've made this year for the course marshals and the roving marshals is that um, you have to be at least a cat one. Um, two or three coach with NICA. And so we have a couple of spots um, where we still need to find coaches to fill those um, course marshal positions. Most of the course marshal positions that we have left now are static. We have also added um, two chefs. So instead of being out there for four hours, you're only out there for two hours. So that, that makes a big difference because I know four hours is a long time to be volunteering. I also want to share that um, we will be giving points to teams for the amount of volunteers that they have. Um, we also feed our volunteers. So that's, that's one of the benefits of volunteering with us. Um, and I think that's 
pretty much it. So again, if you have any questions, just reach out to me. I will be more than happy to um, give you any information um, that you might be looking for just to get you signed up. Thanks, Brian. Diane, great overview uh, for those of you online that have already volunteered. Thank you. If you haven't, please consider. If you know someone that hasn't, please uh, please ask them to volunteer. Uh, obviously vital to how we do things. So we'll pause uh, probably for the next um, 10, 15 minutes on the schedules for Saturday and Sunday. Uh, make sure folks know what to expect when you arrive or some of the activities going on uh, throughout the day. And a good portion of the league staff will actually be out there on Friday uh, helping to get set up. So I'd like to introduce Todd Lester, our race director. Uh, Todd, if you can just walk us through, if you are showing up on Friday, what to expect uh, and a little bit about what to expect Saturday morning when you arrive in terms of pit zone opening and the like. Over to you, Todd. Hello, everybody. Um, yeah, Friday is uh, is a busy day. We get there uh, mid-morning, get the trailer there, start unloading. Uh, ben, our race operations, and Pete, assistant race ops, we will walk the course as in the infield and start marking uh, where we're going to start placing poles and pins, getting uh, snow fencing up, and just getting the pit zone set up. Um, again, it's a lot, of, a lot of manual labor and work intensive, brain intensive as well. So it's, uh, it's a rough day, but uh, we, we knock it out the best we can. Whatever we don't get done, we will get done Saturday morning uh, when, when the more volunteers start showing up. Um, Saturday, is a, like I said, is a follow-on. Uh, we, we check the course, we check everything we've done, make sure we're good, make sure the snow fencing's tight, any tape that is up from the wind, and it's looking like we're going to have some wind Friday and Saturday, so uh, we'll be tightening things up throughout the day, uh, and again, Sunday morning before we actually get to go to race. Um, no such thing as too many volunteers. Like I said, it's work intensive, so if anybody shows up, uh, we'll have plenty for you to do. Uh, yeah, that's, that's really about it, Brian. Okay, that's good. Uh, Michael Lashley, I'm going to um, shift a little bit since folks might be showing up Friday and or Saturday morning for camping. Would you mind talking a little bit about how camping's working for us at Browns Creek? Michael Lashley. They don't mute. Sorry about that. <laughs> That's okay. Over over to you, Thanks, Brian. Yeah, ben. yeah. Um, yeah. Looking forward to seeing everybody this weekend at the race. Um, I've broken it down into two categories. If you're tent camping and you're going to the race track to camp, then it's general admission um, and just pull into the main entrance, and the volunteers will show you where to go. Um, you will be driving past the pit zone and between the parking area and the pit zone with lots of possible people walking back and forth. So please keep it at a reduced speed of around five miles an hour. Um, first come first serve general admission. Um, with that being said, a lot of teams do like to camp together. So, um, you know, if, if you see that happening, please be respectful of others and allow them to kind of gather up in the groups. Um, if you're gathered up in a group and you see someone off by themselves, please be inclusive and, invite them to your group possibly to, to enjoy an evening or something. Um, the other tent camping will be taking place at the Lock and Dam, and we'll have a camping volunteer there to show you where to set your equipment up for tents and stuff. Um, if you're RV parking or travel trailer camping, um, we ask that you go directly to which venue it is that you're going to be camping at and don't take your gear to the track. Um, we don't have the room to accommodate RVs and travel trailers at the track on race day or the Saturday before. Um, so if you're, you know, if you're going to the pump track to set up, please do that before you get to the racetrack to do your pit zone and, and so forth. Um, one word on generators. Um, you know, please be respectful of others and and try not to bring a loud generator. And what I'm what I mean by loud is. If it's set up on the other side of your camper and you can't have a conversation on the opposite side, it's probably too loud to bring to the race. Um, so, you know, again, be mindful of that. Um, some of the spaces are going to be tight and they're very full and we've allowed about 20 feet for each camper. So um, please, you know, follow what the volunteers suggest as far as backing in and getting lined up so we can fit everybody in the spaces. Um, Aside from that, I think that's about that. 
yeah, should be about it. Hey, Michael, this is Ben Harbor. Uh, okay. There was a question in the chat that says, what time can we set up our RV on Friday? And it looks like they're volunteering at a thousand hours or maybe that's 10 a.m. Um, okay. Richard asked the question, could you clarify your volunteer slot for me? And we'll hopefully answer your question. Sure. Uh, if Richard did ask the question, if you want to unmute and clarify your volunteer time, that'd be great. Hey, yep. Yeah, it was uh, 10 a.m. was the volunteer time, and we just wanted to get set up prior to. For, for you guys camping? It was the lock and dam site. Okay. Uh, my plan is to be there early enough on Friday to kind of free, show you where to get set up. And um, and I I think I've got your email from before, so I'll reach out to you, and also get you a map to help direct you where to go. Sounds good. Thanks. Yep. Sure. Hey Ben. Sorry, this is Diane. I I just wanted to ask a question really quick. Sorry, Brian, because he he volunteered. He has um signed up to volunteer. My understanding is that the trailer is not going to be there until about 1130. Is that correct? Yeah, the league trailer will be arriving around 11, 1130 is a good estimate. So we won't be able to start at 10 o'clock. Not that... on Friday. Not on Friday. So I just wanted to make sure that he was aware of that. I know I put 10 o'clock in. But, but it's is, be is delayed Richard's... till like 1130, correct, Ben? Yeah, is Richard's volunteer slot for Saturday or Friday? Friday, I think, at 10. Oh, okay. <clears throat> that was the ben. time. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, most, of, most of the time, Friday volunteer shifts, <laughs> shifts normally start around 12, 1230. Uh, to give time for core league staff to get a game plan, um, take a breather and understand where we need teams to start setting up. <laughs> but if he's coming in Friday early morning, we'll need to get him the location of Lock and Dam so he can set up the RV and be back over at the race course. Sure. Yeah. Diane, if you just don't mind contacting Friday volunteers, let them know we're a little bit later than what we had in the schedule. That'd be really helpful. Absolutely, can do. Okay, yeah, thanks for, for that coordination here. And, and thank you, Michael, for uh, you know setting up our camping. Absolutely. That's great. So uh, back, back to Saturday, you know, it's um, 10 o'clock or so you're coming in. Uh, pit zone will be open. Thanks to, to Ben Harbor for getting our pit zone layout done. You can find a link to that uh, on the website, meaning, you know, your team is going to be in the pit zone right now and how much space uh, you've been allocated. And if you're a head coach, you're probably walking over the trailer at 10 o'clock Saturday to grab your uh, packets, all your race plates uh, for that. Uh, the big big two things on Saturday generally uh, are course inspection, both for coaches and student athletes. So let's go to uh, Sean Moore next to walk through that for everybody. And then we'll go to Shell Frost uh, to describe some of the programs things going on Saturday. Sean, can you walk us through uh, course inspection, please? Yes. Yeah, so uh, course inspection, we, coaches, we will all do a ride together at 1130 a.m. We will be stopping to kind of talk about things that you might have questions about, pointing out things that you need to be pointing out to your new riders that haven't been to Browns Creek before. This, uh, realistically, we have four coach supporters. We will all be wearing orange plaid shirts, uh, pretty distinctive. We will be leading this ride. And you need to think about how many coaches you send. There's not a lot of bandwidth for us to have all of your coaches. So at least head coach um, and maybe one other coach should attend so that they can see everything and then pass that information on to their coaches, the other coaches on your teams. Uh, and that will, that will make sure that we can hit as many people as possible and handle as many questions as possible. Then after that, uh, we will be doing the uh, course inspection for student athletes starting at 1.30. That's divided into three sections. Pre-ride, uh, pre re-ride, and free-ride. Pre-ride is designated for red flag by red flag at the start-finish area. The pre-ride is for student athletes that have never ridden the course, um, are very much beginners, and need a lot of time to stop and look at things. 
this is not the time for your experienced student athletes. This is not the time for returning student athletes who have raced at this uh, race before. And all riders must be accompanied by coaches and we must be adhering to the two to eight uh, or one to six uh, coach per student athlete ratios. That's going to last from 130 to three. Expect lots of stopping, expect lots of people in front of you going slowly. And then after that, at um, three o'clock, we will start the re ride. Re ride really is for any student athlete that just wants to take a look at low speed. Um, so think your maximum probably going to be able to do one lap without stopping. Uh, that's going to last from three to 330. And then after that, um, we no longer have to adhere to the coach to student athlete uh, training ratios. So at, starting at um, 415, we will go with the free ride, which will be de designated with a green flag. And that free ride portion, as long as student athletes are riding in groups of two or more, they can ride on their own. This is really your returning student athletes, your faster student athletes that just want to get out, do some openers, um, spin their legs, like definitely ride faster and without stopping. This is the appropriate time for them. I would not send beginners and I wouldn't send um, intermediate riders unless you feel very confident in their skills on their own, but making sure that everybody is always riding with someone else. And then um, that last lap, shouldn't start after 515 and then at 515 all coaches um, who are interested join us at the start finish line and we will do one lap to sweep the course and make sure that there's no more student athletes on course and at 530 the course will close um, and not reopen again until the next day when we start racing Sean, are there any questions about that If, if there are, throw them in the chat, and Sean, while, while Shell's going, you might be able to answer some of those or we'll catch them uh, at the end. Uh, Shell, can Absolutely. you walk through some programs, uh, activities for Saturday, please? Yeah. So at 1130 is when coach volunteer check-in begins for our GRIT pre-ride, um, and student athlete check-in for that begins at 1150. So our GRIT pre-ride is geared towards beginner riders who would benefit from stopping to session session of the trail. Um, and that required pit zone registration. Um, so those who are registered for it should know. Um, then at 1.30, um, our GRIT tent activities begin. We have games, crafts. We're gonna be painting cowbells for race day. Um, 2.30, we have a health, wellness, and nutrition chat um, with Allison Lancaster, who is a coach from Blue Ridge Cross and a former pro cyclocrosser. Um, and then from 3 to 3.30 at the GRIT tent, we will be doing a GRIT re-ride for the experienced female student athletes. So that did not require pit zone registration. Any female student athlete or female coach may come to the grit tent anytime between three and 3.30 um, and they will be sent out on the course in a ride group. Um, we have a mentor program activity planned for 4.30 for those who registered for that. Um, we will also have a board game hour going on and then 5.30 is when those activities wrap up at the grit tent. Um, we will also have an adventure area open to all registered student athletes. Um, we'll have a skills course, um, a lot of bike games, some yard games to play, um, opportunities, win some prizes, and um, there'll be information on our scavenger hunt at the end of the year available there as well. And those will close at 5.30 also. Good overview. Thanks for that, Shell. And for everyone, there's uh, everything Shell just went through is uh, later on in the race flyer for both GRIT and the adventure uh, area. All that information Shell just went through is included in there. Okay, so uh, Sean did mention 530 uh, courses closed. We all take a big breath and get ready for uh, the next day, uh, Sunday. So I'm going to pause here uh, just for a minute to give everyone an overview of what Sunday looks like. Um, Coaches meeting, uh, mandatory head coaches or representative with Sean uh, at the league trail, eight o'clock in the morning. Uh, at this point, our chief course editors come off course to give it a preview. We'll fill you in on anything you need to know, uh, any changes from overnight and the like. 
uh, 840, an opening ceremony. We'll do the national anthem uh, to start the race. And Ben, I think we have one of our student athletes performing that for us, which is pretty cool. Appreciate you uh, coordinating that. And then 845, we begin staging uh, for our very first race. And I'm really going to use the wave schedule if you scroll down here because uh, this is really the detail you're probably looking for, whether you're a coach or your parent and wanting to know where your student athlete needs to be and show up and what the race time is. It's all included in these uh, wave schedules. So we have four waves uh, this season. We'll start with middle school wave one. Uh, and you'll notice here one of the big changes uh, for this year is to accommodate the large number of student athletes, particularly in middle school boys uh, and freshman and JV1 boys we are running split fields in those categories. So we're separating uh, that category basically in half and we're racing them separately. So they're separated by time. So we're trying to reduce some passing opportunities, but they are gonna be scored together. Uh, and so particularly for the middle school uh, boys, cause we have so many, we've got some pretty significant gaps in between those fields. Again, uh, a lot of unknown riders, particularly sixth grade, not quite sure uh, how they're gonna get around the course. So we're given plenty of space uh, to let them get around the course uh, for that one lap race. Uh, and we're doing that in split field. So again, middle school boys, all those categories, uh, and then JV1 uh, and freshman boys are going to be split fields. And I've got a raised hand from Sean Moore. Uh, just pause here for a second so that we can clear up a little bit of language. There seemed to be a little, a little bit of confusion and it's definitely um, an unfortunate part of utilizing the same terms to represent two different things. So in the context of pit zone, there are two instances where we call something pit zone. The number one is the re online registration system that all of you used to register student athletes, to register for the races, all of those things. That is the online pit zone. On race events, we refer to pit zone, that is the physical area at the race where your team will be will be housed at. Um, that's where you set your tent up and where all of your stuff is. So unfortunately, we use the same term to refer to two dramatically different things. So just wanted to make sure that everyone understood that um, those will be used in two different contexts. Thank you, Sean, appreciate the clarification. Um, so that's the overview of fields, categories, and the like. Again, we've got split fields for middle school boys and then the JV1 freshman boys. Uh, let's talk uh, staging times and our call-up procedures real quick. So very important in that third column there, the staging time, that's when coaches should have their athletes from that category or field in the staging area and teams, we will stage by team. So you will line up with your teams, however many athletes you have for that category, that field, you will be in the big circle. Uh, for those that have been around the league, you know what that process is. Uh, the difference for this season is uh, you will know the call-up order well in advance of the race. Our scoring team has spent the past 48 hours going through all the race registrations for Browns Creek and putting every single category in a ranked order. If we had points on that, those student athletes from last season, we use those points to rank them. And, and then any, any unranked rider, meaning no points, we had no data on them. We just use a random order to put them at the back of that category, back of that field, based on coaches' input on how they thought their student athletes were going to compete. And so uh, I am likely to post those call-up lists for every uh, wave and category tomorrow afternoon. Those will be on the website. Coaches, you will know. Uh, for example, I'll just pick on the Downey's Dirt Dogs because, you know, I happen to know those folks. Uh, if you've got athletes in middle school, boys, eighth grade, you will know exactly what field your athletes are in. And you'll know exactly what order uh, to line them up in. So at 845, I'll step out in front of the staging circle and I will just start calling down that list in rank order. I will give the athlete's name. I'll give the team and then they're headed to the, st the start shoot. And our staging volunteers are going to have that same list and we're going to put them in the start shoot pretty darn quick. And this is just a way to handle bigger numbers uh, as we get later in the season. I don't expect our numbers will decrease. They will likely only increase. So we're going to find some efficiencies by letting everyone know in advance what the call-up order is for every athlete uh, in these fields and categories. So uh, same process, even if you're not a split field for some of our later waves and later categories, again, you'll know the call-up order, be there at your staging time, and then we'll just call each athlete into the start shoot uh, to start the race. 
And I know we may have some questions about that when we get to Q&A, no problem. We will handle that. Uh, let's go back to the Sunday schedule. And Todd, uh, can you just walk everyone through kind of how we close out the day on a Sunday? Closing out the day, sad moments. Uh, we want to keep the day going, but unfortunately, we just got to end all races, all waves are done. Everybody's completed the race. Uh, actually, let me back up for a moment. After that last wave goes out, we'll start tearing down the actual start chute. Um, but we stop there um, because we can't tear down any of the course while they're out racing. So once the last student athlete comes through, we start tearing down the course. That's an all hands on deck. That is everybody and anybody that can carry pins, poles, tape, snow fencing. Uh, we get the course cleaned up and uh, we get the trailer loaded. Once the trailer is loaded and we have the podium set up, we will start the award ceremonies and uh, get the podiums done. And then after that, we will uh, get everybody on their way home. I know that was short and uh, kind of a quick overview, but uh, that's that's really the gist of it. Yeah, I, I recall from all, all the previous races when that last, you know, race is, it's all hands on deck, get everything packed up, let's get it to the league trailer and then we'll, we'll do awards and podiums. Let me say this right now, because everyone's looking at the schedule. Uh, it is a long day here for our first race. And we did that deliberately to spread out those riders, knowing that Browns Creek is one of our shorter courses. So it won't take the athletes as long to get around. So we do anticipate this being a bit of a longer day. The good news is once we have data on most of our riders, we're going to shorten those gaps in between uh, the categories in the fields. And so we'll shorten uh, the day for subsequent races. We're using this time to make sure we can take care of everyone, uh, all those big numbers uh, on the course. And then the last thing, uh, I'll scroll through the flyer here uh, for some major highlights before we get to Q&A. But uh, Sean, could you just talk uh, about, uh, one, the, the significant rule change uh, that we've got on the screen here, but then your role as chief referee and, and the like, and then we'll scroll through the rest of the flyer and get to Q&A. Yeah, so new for this year, we have um, upped the penalty for coaches and parents or guardians that are uh, not wearing a helmet whenever they're on a bike. Um, this is something that reflects one of our real uh, firm beliefs in that all adults are role models and we must role model the behavior that we want um, to see in the student athletes. So because helmets are a very important part of um, our risk management and safety protocol, the uh, current uh, rule is now that there will be a 100 point penalty for the team if a coach, parent, or guardian is found to be with either without a helmet or a helmet incorrectly while on a bike. Um, I think what you'll notice is that uh, Coaches, other adults will probably say something to you if you don't have your helmet on or something like that, just as a reminder. Uh, we did have one instance last season where a parent sort of ignored a bunch of people uh, telling them that they didn't have their helmet on correctly. They had the, the buckle unbuckled and uh, it was brought to my attention. And so as chief referee, kind of if I get involved, then there's going to be a penalty uh, levied at that point. So a lot of times people are going to remind you just to kind of help you out. Um, we all forget, uh, but it's something that if it does come to the attention of the chief referee or any of the other uh, race officials, the, that could be a penalty that gets levied against the team, which would be unfortunate. Um, one of the big things is that uh, I, as chief referee, am there to ensure that we have a safe uh, environment for our student athletes. And that's the reason why a lot of our rules exist. And um, unfortunately, that means that sometimes there are penalties that get levied. But just to make sure, especially with coaches, uh, especially Saturday, you're off and on the bike a lot. Um, it's best to just sort of put your helmet on and leave it on. Um, you're probably going to want to wear a hat uh, because of the sun. So just use a helmet as a hat. And you'll see that I'll be walking around all day long with a helmet on because I know that getting off and on the bike, I don't want to have to try and find my helmet and things like that. So it's best to just be on the side of caution, just have your helmet on so that whenever you do need to hop on the bike, it's there and you don't have to look for it. Sean, thanks uh, so much for that. And uh, for Sean and Shell, my uh, Zoom co-host, if you can just uh, scroll through the chat window, see if there's any unanswered questions we can tee up. 
Uh, as I'm done scrolling through the flyer, we'll start with those and then we'll do the raised hands uh, across Zoom. Uh, I'm just going to roll through um, the rest of the flyer for coaches online. Take a look here. There's an emergency action plan for Browns Creek. Please have a copy of that with you for Saturday for your pre-rides while you're out on the course. We don't have EMS um, on site for Saturday. So if there is any type of issue, please be familiar with generally where access points are and the emergency uh, services that you would call in uh, for that. Uh, we can answer any questions about waves and Q&A. Let me get to some of the other information in the flyer before we close out. Uh, no more uh, petitions for category placement. Those closed last Friday. Uh, Sean, I think you made the point in the podcast. You get one plate for the season. Please hold on to it. Uh, however you want to do that, coaches and parents, that's fine. But if you lose it, you're going to have to buy a new one. Already mentioned about the weather call for tomorrow. Again, knock on wood, looking pretty good. Uh, all those uh, rules and guidance Sean mentioned are found in the NICA handbook, uh, linked in the flyer here, but also linked on our website if anyone wants to take a look at those. Um, part of our, uh, particularly on the multi-lap categories, if you look at back of those wave charts, there's an estimated or earned lap cutoff time. Uh, we're given guidance not to keep student athletes on the course too long based on uh, generally their grade or ability level. And so uh, that's why you will see those earned lap cutoff times uh, in there. And we can answer questions about that uh, during the Q&A. already talked about the coaches meeting. Thank you again, Michael, for the camping and lodging information. Uh, food trucks are coming. Uh, had to make some shifts this week to find some food trucks, but uh, we, we do have some food trucks on site from around the area. And uh, Diane, uh, to reinforce your volunteers, uh, if you volunteer with us, you get a food ticket and you get to go one of these cool food trucks and uh, get your lunch uh, while you're out there on a Saturday or Sunday. Uh, here is league staff information. Uh, new merchandise uh, provider for this season, TC Screen Printing will be on site with us at Browns Creek both Saturday and Sunday uh, with merchandise available for purchase. Uh, what's nice about TC Screen Printing is they have an online store uh, and you could get on there right now tonight and uh, order some North Carolina uh, merchandise if you wanted. Uh, overview of the course and venue map to get everyone oriented on uh, how uh, the infield is generally going to look. I think uh, I'll channel my inner Ben Harbor and Ted, Todd Lester and say we're going to make some decisions on Friday as to what that really looks like uh, while we're out there. So it might look a little bit different, but that's our general layout uh, for the venue. Uh, here's where you find uh, that adventure and grit information. Uh, Shell went through towards the back of the flyer. Um, oh, new, new this year as well. Uh, getting a lot of support from uh, Trek. They are a national sponsor, so they sponsor NICA. Uh, Trek's president, his priority number one this year is NICA, as a matter of fact. And so uh, our local Trek folks are going to come out and bring a hospitality zone uh, to our uh, venues this uh, season. That's pretty cool. Neutral support, uh, two-wheeler dealer down in Wilmington coming up to provide some neutral support uh, for the weekend. And uh, great support from Cape Fear Sorba. Uh, they are doing wonderful work there out of Browns Creek. There's a couple uh, neat surprises on the race course. Uh, I'll, I'll save that. I'll keep that as a prize for that course inspection. But a lot of good work. Uh, pretty much every time I go to Browns Creek, there's something new out there. So they do a great job maintaining that trail. Should be a ton of fun. Uh, yeah, <laughs> let, let me know if you think you want to fly a drone. I'm just, uh, with the number of aircraft that fly right over that venue at the landing field, uh, we, we got to do some uh, real detailed coordination on that. And I haven't received any requests, but if you're thinking that, uh, please let us know. Uh, not necessarily uh, super important right now, but I do want to mention this to everyone. Uh, next week, so we're done with Browns Creek. By Wednesday of next week, I will issue a race report. And much like you received the town hall invite and the single track times, we'll, we'll post the results in there. We'll put some photo links in there. But I'm going to send you an economic impact survey. I'm going to ask as many people as possible to tell us how much money you were spending in the local community. We're going to do that all season. We're going to award some prizes at the end of the season for those who contribute most of that. As a matter of fact, one of those prizes I just uh, found out today from Industry 9 is going to be a wheel set from Industry 9. Uh, yeah, one of our new league sponsors. Uh, so please help, help me when I talk and Todd and Ben, we're going out to survey venues and we're engaged with local communities, why it's important to invest in not only the trails, but the big parking areas for the trails, uh, showing them how much money we're spending in local communities is really impactful. And so we'll ask you to spend maybe three, four minutes after each uh, weekend just to fill out some of that info. And again, we'll send that back out uh, 
uh, to you there. And speaking of sponsors, uh, there's some of the sponsors there. And that brings us pretty much to the end. So uh, Shell and Sean, can you get us caught up on any uh, outstanding questions and then we'll open the, the floor, so to speak? Absolutely. Uh, Shell, do you have anything you want to start with? Nope. So there was a question about seeding and I think it, I offered a, a written explanation, but I think it's a little bit easier to offer an example. So my team, Caldwell County Composite, uh, I have three riders that are all racing the boys 7B category. One of them raced in the sixth grade uh, series last year. So he will be uh, seated according to his finished placing overall in the sixth grade category last year. So whatever number of points he has, that will figure out where he gets ranked. The other two riders that I have, neither of them raced last year with NICA. So I, as a uh, team director, I had to go into a spreadsheet and place them in relative order. This student athlete is faster than this student athlete. And then uh, the uh, staff put together a random draw to see what order all of the teams would have for calling up that rider. And my team, Caldwell County Composite, of the 62 teams in the league, drew number 62. So it goes through and they grab for team number one, who's your fastest rider in the random draw? Team number two, so on and so forth, until we get all the way down to me, team 62. And now my fastest rider, he gets a call up. And then it goes back to the first one and it goes through. And if they have riders, they all go in and it comes all the way back down to me with team 62. And my second rider then gets called up. So that is the random draw seating. Now that exists for the first race. If student athletes that have results from last year don't race the first race, then the second race, they fall into the the random draw. So they don't get to line up according to how they finished last year, unless they raised the first race. Once we go to the second race, it's how did everybody do at the first race of the season and then random draw. So hopefully that kind of explains that. I know it seems a little complex, but it will make a lot of sense on the ground. Are there any questions about that? Cool. Thank you uh, for that, Sean. And uh, if, Shell and Sean, if you don't see anything else outstanding in the chat, let's, uh, if folks, if you want to use your raise hand function uh, in Zoom, and uh, if you don't mind saying who you are and what team you're with, we'll throw your question out there and we'll try and get it answered the best we can. There actually is one follow-up question to the seating. So um, just to kind of make sure I understand what's going on. So your a uh, student athlete is not going to be able to make the first two races. Um, so the rest of the season, um, was this last year he raced at the very end of the pack? Um, can we request a random yes. draw instead? So, it it, so if he has results from last year, he will actually be placed ahead of anybody that, in a random draw. So it's, it's better for him to, to be in the um, ranked order than to be in the random draw. Random draws will not be ahead of anybody with results from last year for the first race. Okay, thank you. No problem. Do we have any uh, raised hands, anything we're leaving out, anything that needs some more explanation for anyone? Hey, Brian, just a comment, <clears throat> if I may. Yes, please, Todd, go for it. Hey, the, uh, the race flyer, we know it's long. It, it seems like there's a lot there, and, and it's designed that way. Is anything and everything you want to know about the race weekend is in the race flyer. So please take the time to go through it. And uh, Ben and Pete have put a lot of time into that and try and make sure every detail is there. Uh, I know there's some things that are not in there, but uh, because you can't get every detail. but uh, but the race flyer is important, so please take the time to review it, and, and don't 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 hesitate to ask a question. Send us an email; we will get you the answer. We will get you the answer. 
And I, I would say to that point that that's good, Todd. You know, all of us will be clad in our, you know, race crew staff jerseys out there. Uh, so please just come come find us if you got a question about something going on uh, Saturday or Sunday. Just yeah, flag us down, and we'll we'll get you a point in the right direction. We've got a couple of questions coming through on the chat. So um, riders who were at Browns Creek last year are not allowed on the pre ride. Uh, red flag. That's the question. This is really like it's interminably slow it is a lot of stopping a lot of looking at things a lot of sessioning so um if the coach says that your uh student athlete needs to be taking that in-depth of a look they're absolutely welcome to be but the problem that we've had in the past is when we're doing this pre-ride very slow stopping methodical we've got faster student athletes that are just wanting to go, 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 go. And it's, we're trying to eliminate that friction. So the, if your student athlete raced last year at Browns Creek, they're probably more of a re-ride and then maybe free ride uh, category rider rather than the strict pre-ride. And then there's another question about are all race flyers active and current now? I'll, I'll turn that over to Brian. I, I got it. Yeah, so that, that that's a good question. Uh, so for all of our venues, yes, we have at least a draft flyer posted uh, on the website with the best available information we have at this time. Uh, the final flyer will be published the Wednesday prior to the weekend. So just like uh, this morning, I posted the Browns Creek flyer. We think that's pretty firm. Uh, let's use Salisbury as an example. Uh, that is still in draft, uh, but about 30 days out, what we will put in that draft flyer is the link to generally volunteers and camping. Uh, we give home teams the first shot at that, but as soon as they get a shot uh, to fill volunteer slots and uh, sign up for some of the camping sites, if on-site camping is available, uh, we will put those links uh, in the flyer and have that on the website. For, for Salisbury right now, links for camping, links for volunteers are uh, in fact live and working. Uh, the one change I think we may see uh, any particular um, race weekend is the wave schedule. Uh, again, we'll close registration the Monday prior. We'll look at what our numbers are and we'll make the decisions as to uh, fields and categories and the gaps between those based on uh, the numbers we have. So that's really what I think uh, the main change will be uh, for our flyers minus the food truck that cancels on you last minute or whatever uh, case may be. Did that uh, answer the question sufficiently, North Wake Trailhawks? Thank you very much. Okay. From uh, Trisha G, uh, there's a question. Is the camping hammockable either for this weekend and or can that be included in future event flyers? So uh, it it's a, depends on how loose of a definition of hammockable you want to go with. Uh, imagine the camping at Browns Creek is a very large field, multiple acres of field. And then there is a single track trail between the field and the tree. So you can certainly go into the tree line, but you will be crossing over the, the trail at, at any point in order to get to the trees. And that tends to be the way most of our uh, areas are. So if that's your main concern, I would say you can always find two trees that you can probably put a hammock between it just depends on how close or how far away you're really trying to be. We have a raised hand from Christina with a question. Uh, yeah, hi, um, I'm from North Wake Trailhawks. Um, this is our first season. My son's an eighth grade boy. I just um, wanted to understand camping. Like, is it the majority of student athletes that are camping, we got a hotel room about, you know, 30, 35 minutes away, just because there's, there doesn't seem to be a lot of hotels in that area. And I think my son's worried that he might be missing out. Um, I, I just trying to get a sense for at most of the races are most of the student athletes camping. Michael, you want to give a sense of what our current numbers are for camping? Um, sure. We have right now there's 165 reservations for camping. Um, that answer might be better addressed with your team, reaching out to some of the other parents or the coaches to see what, what their plans are. Okay. Um, at all the RV sites, I'm trying to group teams together 
Um, again, at the tent capping areas, I'm kind of leaving that up to the individuals. But yeah, there's there'll be a lot of folks capping at Browns Creek. That's a, a huge venue for that. Awesome. Thank you. Sure. We have a hand raised with Northwood Trailhawks as well. Can you talk about uh, crossing the race course during the races? Like there's open spaces designated for crossing the course. Yes, absolutely. Todd, you want to take that or Ben? Sure. Yeah, we, we can tag team it. Um, yeah, we try to have at every course, we have specific areas where we have uh, gates, so to say, to cross the course. Um, Browns Creek is a tough one to do because we can't snow fence and tape the entire field. So when you're away from the main area and you're crossing a course, you really have to pay attention. You got to be looking um, and listening because uh, when they're racing, they're, they're coming on fast. So we don't want you to get hurt. We don't want them to get hurt. Um, so you really got to pay attention. In the main areas, yeah, we have designated areas either before, right around the start shoot to cross it, um, and or after the finish line. So uh, they're different at every race. So Ben, you want you want to add to that? Absolutely. So everything Todd said spot on. Um, at Browns Creek, a lot of people like to go to what we call the super berm downhill to watch your student athletes come out of the single track go down the big hill and make a sharp left-hand turn. That is right up next to the finish line area. There will be a crossing guard just after that. Uh, this year, we are implementing as much as possible the ability for our start shoots to enter the course after the finish line to allow multiple waves to keep going and multiple students to keep racing and riding and finishing. So there's going to be one crossing guard section after those two start laps and finish for multiple laps to continue and then like todd said there'll be one down at the end where we normally put our feed zone and or our um, safety coordinator tent so there'll be two at browns creek and again we we have to stress paying attention if you're out in the course trying to cross and to go spectate Please, please listen and pay attention to cyclists coming up. They and will be going more, extremely fast. Sorry, one more thing that Pete put in the commented on. Yeah, where, where there's tape, two and three strand tape, depending on what it is, never go in between it. Don't don't go between the tape. Don't step over to snow fencing. Um, a, you're gonna you're gonna damage the course potentially um, or the tapes, and uh, and that's ideally that's to keep people out. So please don't go in between the tapes. If you approach a course crossing, we have volunteers that stand there to check the course for your safety and for the student safety. Do not push your way through them. They are there to protect the students and they're there to protect yourselves as well. They will make sure the course is clear on this side and the far side. They've got two different volunteers opening the gate, so to speak, to let you cross. Please be patient with our volunteers and the students. All right, we're coming up on the five minute mark and I'm happy to leave that open all the way to nine o'clock to make sure we've got all the questions answered. And I know, I think I saw some student athletes on the line. Do we have a student athlete question? This is your race. That's what we're all doing this for is you. What you got? Don't be shy. Ask away. While they think of their questions, there's one uh, kind of general thing that I want everyone to understand. And that is that if at any time during the weekend you have a question, just go to the league trailer and there will be somebody there who can help you in any way possible. So if you have questions, concerns, um, you just need to let us know something like that is your main information hub. 
uh, to get a message to anybody that needs it. And anything that you can communicate to us will help. We have a raised hand from Tobin. Hi, this is my son's first year racing with NICA. And I just went through the rule book again because I'd heard somewhere along the way, and this could be myth, that they were not allowed to bunny hop or they always had to have at least one tire on the ground. I didn't see that in the rule book. I was wondering if you could clarify that for me. So there is no rule about questions. this. <laughs> okay. This is this is a urban legend that's been handed down through the generations of NICA that there was two wheels on the ground. Um, so the very first season that NICA existed in North Carolina, there was a rule called the two wheels on the ground at all times rule. Um, but that has since gone away and hasn't been around since their very first season back in 2017. So um, realistically, we teach, you know, uh, the um, wheel lifts and things like that. Uh, the, the big thing is just making sure that riders maintain control and are riding appropriately for what they're doing. So for instance, if uh, we are going over a bump and they get in the air, that's not a problem. If they're in the middle of a pack of riders at the start and they catch air, uh, that's probably a little bit more of an issue. Um, so anything that's potentially uh, injurious to anyone around them, that would be the, the issue. Uh, but other than that, yeah, there's, there's nothing to worry about. So, um, we're not the fun police. Okay. Thanks for clarifying. No problem. Based on the chat, I think we could benefit from a little more clarification about how split fields will be scored, whether those results are separate or combined. Yeah. Um, absolutely happy to address that one. So yeah, if your category has split fields, uh, the scoring team is essentially going to compare the times between those two fields. So uh, they're scored together. And, and just to simplify that, both fields are competing for the five podium spots. So there, there are no separate awards for each field. So they race separately. Scoring team is going to compare the times. They are scored together. Uh, I hope that clarifies the, the question. And to provide a little... I guess, background on that. So I have a student athlete that has never raced in NICA, but he is quite strong. And I have um, really uh, kind of, I'm confident about how well he'll do, but he's going to, you know, like I said, we, we drew the number 62 out of 62 random draw. So he's going to be starting back in the back of that second field. But realistically, he's only got, uh, say, 20 or so riders to actually get through to get to clear track and actually ride without any obstruction. Whereas if we were in a full field of, let's say, I think right now we're sitting at what, 74 uh, seventh grade riders. So if you were starting way back in the back of 74, he would have 70 riders that you would have to try and get through in order to perform. So I think it, it opens it up for those kids that don't have um, a record with us or maybe didn't do well last year, that they actually have the potential for doing better than they would in a, in a true mass start event. All right, we've got about two more minutes, uh, probably time for one more question or two quick ones from anybody. Hey, Brian, Michael Lashley here. Yes, Michael. Um, a quick note on camping, um, especially tent camping, be aware that there are fire ant mounds around Browns Creek, and there's also some thorns in the field. I don't know what the proper term is for these things, but when you're setting your tent up, just be aware and make sure that you know, it's a, got a good clear area and you're not sitting up on top of some kind of, um, I call them prickly pears, but I'm not sure what they, they really are. So, yeah, that's it. Uh, the famous Browns Creek burrs or what? Yeah, I don't, I don't know either. Sand There's burrs. a little cactus out there, I think. Sand burrs. There you go. Sand burrs. Probably uh, yep. will be, uh, a, a name of one of our new teams next season, the sand burrs. That was so, from the North Wake Trailhawks. So thanks very for good. that. Okay. All right. North Wake uh, Sandburs. 
per- perfect. And then uh, Jeff Cathy has a really good um, words of wisdom. So for those of you folks that are going to be staying at hotels in the area, do not leave bikes outside. Take them into your hotel room. Uh, bikes locked up on uh, vehicles are not impervious to being stolen. Um, I had bikes stolen off the back of my van uh, on a road trip. It's quite easy for anyone that actually wants to get your bike to get your bike if uh, it's locked on a car. It's lots of time for them to get to it. So just take them into your hotel room. I've never stayed in a hotel that had a problem with you taking a bike in. Um, So take the extra precaution, bring them in, and that way you know you have them. Thank you for that, Sean. And uh, we we are at nine o'clock. Let me, uh, one, uh, thank you all uh, for dialing in. Uh, if you've got any comments, feedback about how we're doing this, it is my intent to run a town hall for all of our venues uh, to answer those questions. Each venue is a little bit different, so we'll walk you through those differences uh, for sure. Thank you to the staff. Thank you to all volunteers uh, for putting this together. Uh, I joined the league in September of last year, and it's absolutely impressive, all the preparation that actually gets us to this point. And I'm pretty sure we're all ready to crank at the creek at this point. And uh, so looking forward to seeing everyone up there. And uh, again, if you got any questions, comments, please uh, feel free to shoot them my way. So thank you, everyone. Have a great night and go watch The Mandalorian or something. This is the way. <laughs> Good night, everybody. Thanks, everybody. Good night. Thanks, Brian. Thanks, Dan. Good night.